I became the hero who banished the protagonist chapter it seems something strange is happening, the queen's face was visibly tired from the frequent meetings she'd had lately, Daphne resisted the urge to sigh inwardly and laid the report before her, Agnes poured over them, cover to cover, her eyes looking all over as if hoping it would show her the answer, I have been receiving regular direct reports of monster activity in the capital and the north so I was already aware of the irregular movements but this is the first time since my reign that I've heard voices of unrest from the rest of the continent. Agnes flipped to the report's first page labeled Northern Monster Trends. Her hand began to flip through the pages, reading each one carefully. So it's similar to last year's event with the giant, more disturbing news in the absence of the hero. What a headache. She turned another page. Agnes read the report to the end, then sighed and reached for the next one. When she had finished reading them all, the reports were stacked in the corner of the throne room. Agnes' worried expression faded with each report. The worries brewing in her mind were gone, replaced by a cold rational that analyzed the situation. Which do you think is more reasonable to believe? The possibility that a catastrophic beast has appeared in every corner of the continent or that the sixth disaster is affecting the beast's movements. Daphne looked stunned at the mention of the disaster. Your Majesty. Your insight is truly extraordinary, Agnes continued to read the rest of the material, it is most likely the effect of the meteor, I believe it's close enough for monsters to sense it, and they are likely growing restless with its presence, it's like an omen, though much more threatening, we agree with your assumption, it should be time to mobilize the nation's forces, furthermore we should contact other countries for their support, Agnes' gaze was warm as she looked at Daphne, I will support you, of course, but most of my forces will be stationed in Keros. I do not wish to be accused of not properly defending my country as its monarch. I have spoken presumptuously. Agnes stood from her seat. Daphne stepped back, her head bowed low at the Queen's resolute demeanor. There was compassion in her eyes as she looked at the wizard. Don't be so disheartened, my dear. I know you follow the hero's wishes more than anyone. I would have said the same if he had asked me directly. You've done your duty as a member of the Hera's party, so don't be ashamed. You are not the villain here. I am. Agnes' words were heavy. V. Daphne watched her walk away with wistful eyes. If Eroy had been here, would he be able to convince her to leave the country to defend the world? Daphne didn't have time to ponder, for she was also busy. Daphne, Jorg, who had attended the debriefing with Daphne, called out to her. She regained her senses and turned to face her companions. Her Majesty is right. We have only done our duty. Daphne shook her head at Jorg's consolation. I didn't realize that not having Elroy would be so devastating. Elroy will come back. He always comes back whenever we're in trouble. We need to be ready. All we can do is buy him time until he's ready. They had to do what they could before he returned. I'm going to continue my observations. I need you two to focus on what we discussed understood, vigilance checks and training the soldiers against monsters, warning the public and advising them to evacuate, Jorg nodded, reminding himself of what he had to do, I don't know when or what will happen, but Oroy seemed to know what was coming from what he wrote in that letter, Jorg's face looked ten years older as he spoke, a heavy sigh escaped from his stoic mouth as he tried to keep a straight face, I wish he would just tell us what the hell he knows. To have faith that he would return was to put the responsibility on the hero. It doesn't mean he'll always succeed because even when he's prepared, he might fail when the going gets tough. Elroy was made of the same flesh and blood as any other man. I don't think he's the kind of person who wouldn't tell you the truth if he could. Marion, who had been watching, spoke up. He even told me to wake him up if we were distressed. I hope the time doesn't come when we have to wake him up before he gets up by himself. The meteor is approaching. In the uneasy silence, the hero's party stared at the reports. Doom seemed closer than ever. If we don't stop the monsters coming to attack, we'll be dead before the meteor can land. If we are able to stop them, we won't have our full power to deal with the disaster. Even if we somehow ignore the monsters and are fully prepared, could we even stop the meteor? You're getting pessimistic, Jug. Aren't you supposed to be the hopeful one? Yes, but now that I have something to lose, I'm afraid. Jorg narrowed his eyes and sighed. Forget it. I'm going to check the training ground. It's better to be tense than relaxed. 
Oh Roy, you son of a bitch, I don't want to relay on you too much. Oh Roy was still sound asleep. The rest of the party scattered to fulfill the task he had left for them. Simply put, May in the North could not be called warm. Less than a year ago, the giant approached the fortress, and the slushy mud from the melted snow hadn't changed. Moss and dirt got stuck between the axles and crushed them. It was fine as long as the soil was wet, but the mud would harden along with the shafts if the rain stopped for a moment. Fucking rain again, Pobler cursed in frustration as he scratched at the dried mud. Uh, the water in his canteen wasn't enough to wash off the soil, let alone get it all off. His caracas glanced at him, listening to his half-hearted cries. What the hell is my life? A year ago, he had been sent to the north as a trainee. He participated in the most intense defense in the history of ever Nodino, the kingdom. That was reason enough for Pobler and his platoon of thirty men to work as messengers for the north. Pobler resignedly laid his head on the wheel, then lifted it again. I guess it was easier back then. Pobler sighed and remembered. It had been hard, but it had been fun. Jorg was there, too. He kicked the wagon wheel angrily, and the impact sent mud flying everywhere. There's the Pobler we know. Shut up, let's go. The wheels finally started rolling again. Pobler climbed into the coachman's seat, and the men, who had paused to rest, hauled themselves up with grunts of pain. The end of the forest was near. Evernote would soon greet them. Do you feel it? I was going about to ask you the same. But rain and mud weren't the only obstacles in their path. The plate intensed as they felt a chill creeping up their spines. The road to the north was even more difficult than before. Monster attacks had suddenly become more frequent, and a part of their troop had perished, entired of this. This. Why did they suddenly increase like this? The signs were clear. Rumors had been circulating that monster attacks had increased lately, but this was more than an increase. Pabler couldn't shake the feeling that someone with malicious intent was sending hordes of monsters like vassals. All hands. Battle formation. Less than ten minutes after resuming movement, the line halted. Perhaps they had stayed in one place too long this time. But the current wave was different, much larger and faster than the ones before. Pablo, if you find me, scatter my remains in the sea. Phew. Fight with your sword. The same goes for the others. We won't recover your bodies if we don't kill every one of them. What if we all don't make it? Shut the f up, man. In going to live. Pobler gave him a glance and drew his sword. He had no intention of dying, but in a life where he had to wear his uniform, he didn't have the freedom to die when he wanted to. The rest of the platon felt the same way. Go live your lives. I can't afford to protect you. Don't come back to curse me when you're dead. Whoever does will get cursed by me when I die. As the soldiers grinned at each other, the creatures appeared. Trees creaked and crashed and the monsters began their march through the scattered leaves and moss. We're not going to win this, Pobler muttered under his breath. Every conceivable species of monster was there, bears and wolves with their foal mouths and even a creature called a crawler lurked in the shadows, closing in fast. The sound of swords could be heard here and there as people lost their concentration in fear. Pobler raised his sword in anticipation of his end. Shit. Everyone, hold your ground. Ye. Yeah. Let's fight and die. As Pobler raised his sword high in determination, he heard a shout from behind him. It's a good thing we met. Stand behind me. A burst of blue light filled the forest. Pablo recognized the voice at once, and his eyes sparkled with joy. The banner of Evernod flew through the broken trees, and the shouts of the North's knights rose. Deputy Commander Luke, unsheath your swords. This is nothing compared to the giant's army. At Luke Stroff's words, the fear that had overwhelmed the soldiers vanished. Led by Pablo, who saw a ray of hope, the kingdom's men rushed toward the wave of monsters. The son of the northern archduke stood at the head of the line and began to slaughter the creature. The wave was quickly suppressed. The soldiers from the capital worked as one with the knights of Evernode, who had worked hand in hand with them on many occasions. With the possibility of further attacks, Luke led his troops out of the forest. What brings you here, Deputy Commander? There were too many soldiers and knights for this to be a simple patrol, and their boiling spirits and warlike intentions were far from peace time. Luke's expression as he looked back at him was steadfast and unflinching. Evernote is preparing for an all-out war. The voice was strong and fierce. The spirit of the North. 
to avenge the humiliation of nearly losing our Lord.